Hi, welcome everyone. Today we are having a presentation in alignment with our Florida Heritage Foods Initiative. Um, and we have our subject matter experts in today for our Indian cultural plants. We have Professor Manisha and Swati um, doing our presentation today. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, I'm Manisha Ranade, and we are pleased to bring to you a session on Indian cultural plants, Eat, Heal, and Pray. So this is brought to you by ICEC, the India Cultural and Educational Center, which is a nonprofit that started in Gainesville back in 1991, mainly to uh, promote um, the cultural values uh, from India. Uh, but amongst other things, some of their, our mission uh, also includes promoting Indo-American cultural interaction by organizing programs such as these for in, uh, exchange of cultural and educational ideas. Also, it gives an opportunity for the members to, um, to participate in greater, in contributing to the greater Gainesville community. And uh, these are all the, the people who helped bring this uh, project together. Uh, we're going to start off with Dr. Swati, who is here. She's going to do the first part of the presentation. Uh, then me, Manisha Ranade, I'm going to do the second part. And uh, some of these, uh, some of our members were not able to come here due to the rescheduling, but you'll be able to meet them later, uh, the ones who are here. And we are going to show you a demo of different ways in which Indian, in which the plants are used in the Indian context. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Swati. Hey guys, thank you all for coming. Today I'll be talking about a few plants that we use as a part of Indian culture, food, medicine, as well as rituals, okay? Just a question before I get into that. What do you guys think of when we say India? Any, anybody? What do you think of when you think India? Sorry? Curry, okay. Food? I it's far away. <laughs> it's far away, yes. Lots of people, bright colors. What else? Saris. Oh, wow. Great. I have some of those people. Yeah, we are second most populous country uh, in the world. Yoga. You must be familiar with yoga, right? You know, that's brought to you from India. Taj Mahal. You guys didn't think of that? Food. Oops. Oh, it's not animated pretty well. Or it's not actually showing up in the screen. But we have food. We have Ayurvedic medicine, which is part of you know, Indian culture and tradition. That is also a primarily from plants, plant-based medicine. And obviously, Bollywood, most world know Bollywood, right? So I just put a few things here, plants. Um, so um, in today's presentation, I will be talking briefly about ginger, turmeric, holy basil, and henna. How many of you have heard of at least one of these plants or used one of these plants, all of these plants? Some of you have. Great. So these are pretty popular throughout the world for various reasons. First, coming to ginger. It's not displaying the slides correctly some, somehow. Um, so ginger is one uh, you know, plant that goes beyond flavoring and spice. And not just Indian culture, several Asian uh, people, countries use ginger, right? I have uh, here for you uh, a ginger plant, although that's not showing properly. I have an actual plant to show you which is fine. So what you have in ginger, actually, the, the part that is edible, can you guess anybody, the part that is edible is this one, right? And what is the part? Root, you think. And that's the misconception. That's not the root, OK? <laughs> that's not the root. That's actually the stem. We call it rhizome. And the roots are these, OK? These are the roots. This is not the root. The, the part we eat is the stem, which is called rhizome, OK? So that's the rhizome. And 
this is a pseudo stem, which is formed by the compaction of the leaf bases. And the rhizome is of importance to us. And this grows pretty well. This is from my home. It grows well in Gainesville. And that uh, rhizome is what we eat, right? Or we use for several purposes. And some of the medicinal properties of ginger, it can be a carminative. It prevents gas um, and uh, a flatulence in the uh, intestines. And anti-emetic, it prevents vomiting and nausea. I don't know how many of you have travel sickness. I do. You know, especially when I go to India and the traffic and stop and go and traffic, I get travel sick and I, I like to chew on some ginger candy. It helps me right away. Um, Anti-inflammatory, it reduces inflammation. So, and there are several other uh, properties to ginger, why ginger is helpful for us. So uh, that's what I said, chronic arthritis as well, people use ginger for. Not going into chemistry, I teach an introductory medicinal plants class at UF to undergraduate students where we discuss some chemistry of medicinal plants as well. But just to give you a brief uh, you know, overview of what, why ginger has those properties. So ginger has this compound called gingerol, which gives that pungency that we taste in ginger. And it's synthesized in the plants from an amino acid called phenylalanine. It's an aromatic amino acid from which the ginger oil is made in plants. And that's the pungency principle or the main uh, compound in ginger. And we also have, uh, you know, so you have, how many of you have heard of dried ginger? Any, oh yeah, many of you, we know dried ginger. It's simply, you know, you air dry, or there are different ways of drying the ginger, but all you do is remove the water. From ginger, you dry it, right? And the ginger oil, you remove this water molecule, and then you get this compound called shogal, which is the main uh, compound in dried ginger, right? So these are the two uh, pungency principles that we care about in ginger. Rhizome, not root, now you know. Um, the distinctive aroma. So. Besides the pungency, you also have nice aroma from the ginger, right? And that's because of several volatile compounds uh, present. And so how do you know the ginger quality? Quality of a ginger, whether it's a good, nice ginger that you want or not. That's mainly the pungent principle that's in there, um, the aroma that's coming from there, and also the fiber. So all these constitute the components that we look for in a good ginger, quality of the ginger, OK? So here I have anybody who wants to take a closer look at the ginger plant are welcome to do so after I finish, OK? Um, the next plant uh, I'm going to talk about is turmeric. We all know turmeric. It's a common plant. It grows pretty well. I have the plant here. It's from my home as well. I grow turmeric. And again, it belongs to ginger family. So what is the plant part we use again in this? Rhizome, thank you. Rhizome, stem, yes, that's the rhizome here. It's almost identical to ginger. Although, you know, when you open that and you, you know, you cut it, you see the bright orange color, and that's your turmeric, right? That's how you know the difference. If you just see your rhizome, it's hard to tell, but both belong to ginger family, okay? So turmeric is also ginger family, and it's been traditionally used in India for centuries, mainly for skin-related problems. And there are several other uh, problems that we could use um, turmeric for. Its rhizome is used as a culinary spice and also for uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, just traditional medicine from India, the turmeric is used. And turmeric is also promoted as dietary supplement for various conditions, including arthritis, digestive disorders, skin disorders, and so on. If you go to a, any pharmacy and look at the over-the-counter, you know, nutraceuticals or other, you know, products, you'll see turmeric in so many of them, right? It's a common ingredient. So what is in turmeric that we care about? It, the compound, again, is called curcumin, okay? The, that's the curcumin is also a polyphenolic compound. And it's the principal component of turmeric. And it is the claimed to be the bioactive compound responsible for all the beneficial effects that this turmeric has. Okay, And 
You'll be amazed. There are more than 120 clinical trials done using this particular compound or class of compounds from turmeric for various different diseases, uh, including cancers. So another cool thing, uh, not going deep into chemistry, but if you look at ginger oil from ginger, shogol from the dried ginger, and then the curcumin from turmeric, you can see how similar structurally these compounds are, right? Um, which is amazing how, you know, these all belong to ginger family. They have bioactive compounds that are structurally very similar to each other. However, they have such difference in flavor or taste and so on. This is how turmeric is grown in India or cultivated. It's usually grown as an intercrop in different farms, like coconut farms. You can see coconut trees, and in between, this is grown as an intercrop. And you can see how we're drying the turmeric rhizomes um, here. And once they're dried, they're made into powder, which is the dried spice that you find in supermarkets. And this is, uh, the turmeric is, beyond, is used beyond food and medicine, so it's culturally uh, you know, considered very sacred and auspicious. So we use for various uh, festivals and in weddings. You can see that we smear turmeric paste all over because it's considered good for your skin, right? And the other plant I'd like to discuss is um, tulsi or holy basil, okay, osimum. You know basil, right, the Italian basil. This is a, a, a sibling of that, um, belonging to the same family. Uh, but this is a very common plant in the households of uh, Indian families. Even in, in the US, we all have, almost every one of us have this plant at home. It is prayed, it's considered auspicious and sacred as well. So this plant is called holy basil. Okay, And there are different forms of uh, basil. Again, it's not displaying um, the pictures. Uh, we have green kind and uh, slightly reddish kind. So we call it different ways. On the name of a god, uh, Rama is the green color one. And we have a, a slightly purplish reddish uh, leaved one, which is called Shama or Krishna. Tulsi so is again uh, after the name of the god. So uh, holy basil is also used in Ayurvedic medicine, which is an Indian traditional medicine. And it's called queen of herbs. And the chemical components, there are several phenylpropanoids, just like the ones that we discussed in ginger turmeric as well, and terpenoids, which are the fragrant compounds. So there are several products uh, of Tulsi again. You can go to Walmart, Publix, you will see uh, lots of uh, products made out of Tulsi, mainly uh, teas. You can see, and uh, our amazing colleagues made amazing tea, hot tea back there, which is made up of uh, ginger, turmeric, tulsi, and honey, okay? You're welcome to take a sip, it's hot, and enjoy the drink. And so the last plant I want to talk about today is henna plant. How many of you have heard of henna? Did you ever get a tattoo with henna? You did, some of you did. Right, so henna is another plant that grows pretty well in Gainesville. I recently realized that this plant is from my home also. Um, and um, it has, these leaves make a compound called lawzone, and that has this orange-red pigment that can stain your skin or your hair. So people in India use it mainly um, for festivals and to, to tattoo their hands. It's like it fades away in two weeks. It's not a permanent tattoo and also to color their hair. It, they say it's good for your hair as well and your scalp. So that's the most, uh, you know, what henna is used for. And this plant grows pretty well in Gainesville. So far I have to see over winter how it does. I, I have one in, in the ground and one, uh, you know, saved in a pot to bring it inside when frost. So with that, I will stop and I, I'll take any questions you may have. Otherwise, I'll pass on to Manisha. Questions? Yeah. Genetically modified food is similar anywhere in the world. 
because the techniques, the technology that we use to generate those is identical, pretty much, right? But how the genetically modified food is regulated uh, can be different in different countries, with Europe being very strict uh, about genetically modified food. Uh, whereas in US, we have certain genetically modified food. It could be in corn, soybeans. These are very popularly known genetically modified food. And in India, too, uh, we have a few, like cotton, for example. Uh, we have uh, genetically modified cotton. It's called Bt cotton. And the reason for it was the cotton crop was devastated with pests. And that was the one solution that could prevent the pests and also spray multiple insecticides to control cotton bollworm. So there are genetically modified food uh, also, but regulations are quite different between the countries. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Is there a certain point in history where these plants were like suddenly started being used in Indian culture, or have they kind of been used like long far back as history tells? That's a good question. You know, uh, historically and evolution. So you know, let's let's not talk about evolution uh, because it's a different topic. Because how plants evolved, and you know from being in aquatic environments, which is 150 million years ago, they came to terrestrial environments. And how they survive in a certain environment, that actually frames a plant, how a plant is. But coming to use of the plants, right? Uh, certain plants are used in India. Certain plants are used in uh, you know, Persia. Certain plants are used by Native Americans. Certain plants are used by U Europeans, and so on. That is called ethnobotany. So how plants are used differently by different cultures. And that evolved with that culture, right? For example, uh, several ancient cultures, Indian culture is ancient culture, right? And so we use several plants, which are historically recorded in some of the scriptures. In Vedas, we call it. That's why we call Ayurveda, because they are the Vedas are the scriptures where we have sev mention of several plants. And in one of my lectures, I give a whole, whole lecture on um, ethnobotany and uh, you know, how different cultures use plants. But to, to answer your question, Vedas are the scriptures, Indian scriptures, where we have mention of several plants that are used for medicinal purposes and several other purposes. And that is passed on to the next generations. And so several have unfortunately faded away, and we still carry on with some in still, uh, you know, in our generation, and hope to carry on in the future. But every culture has their uh, cultural plants, and they have potential benefits either as food, medicine, or other cultural rituals. So, yeah. You had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's reasonable <laughs> question. I use ginger in most of what I cook at home, right? Uh, you know, all of you might have eaten ginger if you have gone to any Asian restaurant. Uh, I use so uh, with turmeric, I uh, make a paste of it, and you know, use in. Uh, I'm a Hindu, and we use for rituals. But I'm going to harvest this before the frost. I'm going to dry it out, and then make powder of it and use it as a spice in my cooking as well, right? And this one. I make hot tea sometimes, and you will taste that back there that we have. I didn't make it, uh, others made it, and, and you will taste that. And I use this uh, to make teas. I take that uh, hot tea to my students at UF, and they love it. Um, and henna, I actually uh, tried it. I grew it, and I ground the paste from the leaves, and I actually applied to to my hand. And it faded away, but you can see my nails are still <laughs> tainted. Um, with henna, it, the nails take longer to fade away. But that's how I use uh, all these that I got. And that is a very good question. I'm a plant scientist. I'm not any human uh, uh, side of the research. But one thing I can tell you with curcumin, for example, it, is, it has several uh, issues with uh, bioavailability and solubility as well. So. Several clinical trials, as I mentioned, have been done, but they couldn't nail, nail it down to curcumin is effective for cancer. Curcumin is the compound 
because it has issues with in, it's an interact interfering molecule curcumin so what uh, it is is that for example uh, you know on the pharmacy side of uh, research they try to take a particular compound and they try to test it for a particular you know uh, purpose like is it anti cancerous or is it you know pain relieving and they try it with different assays whether this compound is binding to a receptor or not and so what happens is it's an interfering molecule so it doesn't let the the results be clear because it interferes with different assays and so on so there are issues with these compounds to nail down that it's like a magic bullet it's most of the times it's not like a magic bullet for this compound for this in some cases there are magic bullets like let's say morphine for example we all know morphine is a pain relieving uh, compound it's like a magic bullet it's extracted from opium poppy latex and it's it pain it's a pain relieving analgesic it's like a magic bullet but most compounds are not magic bullets so so phenylpropanoids is a one word i mentioned it and i didn't talk much about it most uh, you know compounds that belong to that class of uh, chemical compounds uh, phenylpropanoids there are different classes of phenylpropanoids like flavonoids flavones flavanols and so on several of them have this antioxidant properties to scavenge the free radicals that that that's why we we always say eat colored fruits and vegetables because they have the antioxidant properties like yeah any colored fruit uh, foods you know fruits and vegetables they have they tend to have more uh, antioxidant properties thank you for your questions any other questions if not thank you so much for your attention i will give it up to you thank you hello first a disclaimer i'm not a plant scientist or a chemist uh, <laughs> i'm just a consumer of some of these plants that i'm going to talk about in the indian context So the first one I'm going to talk about is the banana and I brought a banana leaf for you guys to see you probably have seen it here is from my neighbor's yard I I'm not very good at growing plants so I'm just going to show you things <laughs> mostly on the screen and then we have some demos in the back uh, so the botanical name is Musa acuminata is that how you say it acum okay okay <laughs> all right thank you uh it 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 comes in many sizes and different varieties but prominently there are two varieties that are common one is the one uh, plantain that is used typically raw it would be cooked as a vegetable raw fruit is cooked as a vegetable and eaten and very often in savory dishes the other one is um, more ripe variety uh, smaller possibly and it's used um, as a sweet fruit like for desserts um so it's it's very interesting the banana itself is a very um uh extremely it's very um it's used ubiquitously in india i would say like all over india it's used regularly and i think in florida it probably grows best in south florida probably in northern florida in this climate it it gets sometimes the plant may not grow as well and not get the fruit but definitely in south florida you can get it. so how are they used um you notice here there is this banana leaf plate this is very common or it used to be very common when i was a kid growing up we would go to weddings and you know there would be like this rows of tables with banana leaves as plates so you might wonder how can you use this as a plate one nice feature about the leaf is that if you pour water onto it it's not going to wet the leaf it's just going to go over so you can actually eat curries you know you can eat something that's wet on a banana leaf it's very clean it also has a nice distinct smell like a fresh uh, from a fresh uh, leaf uh, so uh, it it's used in um especially in uh, uh, religious occasions or weddings that used to be common uh it's also considered uh, uh i guess more pure uh, you don't have to wash it so when you're done you would uh, it's compostable sometimes it is also given to cows to eat so it's like complete it's like a zero waste system you know you eat the food on the on this plate and then the plate is also eaten uh the, there are other ways here you can see something like i guess these steamed rolls can be made with by wrapping the banana leaves around rice or other grains as well as um roasting it 
uh, wrapping the banana leaves around some food item and then roasting it. So the, these are multiple ways the leaves are used in, as a food. And uh, I just wanted to share a couple of recipes that are fairly simple to make. The first one on the left, this is called shikran, which is essentially just um, a combination of milk, very often warm milk, milk, sugar, and banana, sliced bananas. Very easy to make. Uh, in fact, I would say my mom is a big fan of this dish because you can just have it with chapati, which is an Indian bread, and it's, it's a full meal. Uh, so shikran is very common, um, especially from western parts of India. And then there are some fritters um, that people make on special occasions, like fried fritters. You may have seen, I think in Caribbean cooking, you probably see fried plantains. So something similar, and even that, it's fairly easy to make with very few ingredients. Uh, some whole purpose flour, banana, sugar, and some spice like cinnamon or cardamom. The other uh, snack that is very popular uh, made from bananas is this, are the salty plantain chips. And I noticed in the store, when I first, I, I, I guess I was trying to look for banana chips, they would all be sweet. I don't know if you noticed, but lately we often find the salty ones, which are not sweet. There's no, there's nothing, no sugar added, just salt. And that's something that used to be very popular when I was growing up. Uh, it has a lot of medicinal uh, benefits. And again, um, just like uh, Swati mentioned about Ayurveda, in Ayurveda, it is considered as a cooling food. So if you have, for instance, if, you, if, if the heat is very high, you can eat banana for, for its cooling value. It's also, it's full of fiber, so that's good for constipation. Also, it is fairly uh, filling. So it's very nutritious and filling, and it's often used in fasts. It's full of calories. And you might wonder, what is this fast? If you're fasting, you should not be eating. But the one interesting thing about uh, the fasts that are um, fairly common in India are not starving. They're not starvation fasts. When you are fasting, it doesn't mean on, you're not eating anything. But instead, you're eating certain foods only. For instance, you might eat only fruits and, uh, and milk or dairy. Um, so in such case, yes, you can use, you can eat the banana and it's going to keep you full until the, you know, the next time. And of course, it's rich in potassium and that's why very often you will find uh, when people want to go to the gym and they don't really want to eat a heavy breakfast, they will often opt for like half a banana or a banana and that's, you know, that, that's filling. So these are the medicinal um, benefits. Next, we'll go on to coconut. So I have this great, I, I guess, privilege to talk about all foods that I love and I use almost every week or you know, maybe not quite daily, but almost uh, all the time. Coconut is one such um, uh, plant, coconut, the coconut plant, Cocos nucifera. It's called Kalpa Vriksha in Indian languages. Vriksha means tree. And uh, Kalpa Vriksha essentially means it gives everything. It gives everything you need for your life. So this is when a, a coconut is cut. This is what it looks like. There's, there's a white flesh. And we have some demo in the back. So right after the uh, talk, you're welcome to go ahead and look at uh, the coconut. We also have a grater. So you're lucky you can see some of these uh, demonstrations. So this is what a uh, uh, ripe coconut looks like. And this is a tender coconut. Tender coconut is full of very sweet water. Coconut water, which you, you know, sometimes you, you probably get it in the superstore. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm going back to those times when, uh, or even now when I go back to India, they sell these, the coconut water, they sell coconut water on um, street stalls. You can just walk on the street and you can have someone give you coconut water. They're going to cut it and then give you like, you know, one, uh, one coconut worth um, water to drink. That water is very tasty. And uh, India has a large coastline. It's in the tropics. So the tropical coastline is really good for this plant, for growing the plant. As food, how do we use it? Oh, this is what I was mentioning. Remember on the street hawkers, they will sell you these. They will, you know, they'll, in front of you, they will cut it, and then they'll put a straw, and you can drink it right there. Uh, and here is a picture of the grated coconut. Grated coconut is uh, heavily used in lots of gravies in Indian food. Uh, in fact, any food, and I believe also in Thai food, in many other foods uh, from Southeast Asia, they use uh, coconut. 
it's eaten by itself. If you eat the flesh by itself, it's very, it's very tasty and it's a little bit crunchy. Uh, it's cooked as well in various dishes. Uh, the water is also a good thirst quencher. It's high in potassium, so that you know, gives it the nutrition. So if you have, for instance, if you have fever or you're not feeling well and you need to be hydrated, this is a very good option. And then the other part of the coconut, the coconut oil, which is also, which has gained a lot of popularity, I want to say in the last probably 10 years, is uh, also comes from that dried fle uh, flesh. So it's dried and then made into uh, coconut oil. Coconut oil can be used for many things. It can be used in cooking. You can actually eat it by itself. Uh, you can cook it, you can heat it. And also as massage oil, it's, um, it's very valuable. It has very nice uh, qualities. And it is also used in various decorative arts and crafts throughout India. For instance, you can make purses, you can make bags or boxes out of the coconut shell. It's hardy. Uh, you can make these very creative um, baskets from the leaves. Or thatched roofs use coconut uh, leaves. And one more important use is the scrubbing pads. Uh, so sometimes what we used to do is used, we would take the coconut, because coconut was used at home a lot, fresh coconut, and we would take the, the, um, the fiber out of it and then use that as a scrubber, like a natural scrubber. You don't even have to convert it into any different shape. You, you could just take those fibers and use it to scrub pots and pans, and it, because of its rough nature, it's a very good um, uh, scrubber. It's also used in a lot of uh, rituals. So uh, in pujas, which are uh, sort of the Hindu uh, worship altars, it, uh, the coconut is used extensively. Or at weddings or other ceremonies, uh, coconuts are uh, quite uh, in demand. And with that, I'm going to come to the last plant that I will talk about. It's the moringa plant. And I think many of you might have seen it in the farmer's market. I don't know how many of you go to the local farmer's market. You guys go. They they do. Um, they sell the moringa leaves. In fact, the moringa is uh, something that um, we we call it the drumstick plant. So it is very popular um, in uh, curries. You can use the drumstick and make uh, curries out of it. Uh, especially this curry, the sambar, is a delicacy in South India. Uh, and uh, the leaves themselves can be used in salads. You can make a vegetable out of it. Uh, it has lots of nutrition. It has a slight bitterness to it, very slight, and that's why it's good for diabetes. Uh, also, it is rich in iron, uh, and it has many other wonderful properties. Uh, I have actually a whole booklet uh, in the back that displays all the properties of Moringa, something that I'm not even as uh, knowledgeable about, but I've as I'm you know, looking at these things, I'm finding out. So Moringa is uh, also something that is native in India, and it is found here. And particularly in Alachua County, we have Moringa trees. Um, so that's, that's the last one that I wanted to talk about. And I'm just going to uh, leave you with um, um, some, uh, just, uh, uh, some pointers on what we have. We have a, a few demos at the back of the room. There is uh, the coconut demo, there's moringa plant, there's herbal tea for you to try, and there is a whole section of the cosmetics that come from using uh, these plants, how they're used in India and how they're uh, very popular and they're available here. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take, or we can also go to the demos and you can do hands-on trials. Any questions?